This is The Right Approach. I'm J.W. Judge, and with me is my co-host, Barbara Hensky. This is a podcast for writers to learn more about the craft and business of writing as we explore a new topic every week. Our guest today is Alessandra Torre, a New York Times, USA Today, and Wall Street Journal bestselling author of 23 novels. She is the founder of the Authors Conference, InkersCon, and the creator of a community for writers, And I don't know how you get everything done in the same amount of time that all of the rest of us have. So, um, Alessandra, welcome to The Right Approach. And I was going to say, just jump in with that. It's amazing because we talk about the craft and the business of writing, and you're at the top of both of those, which is just remarkable. Uh, Well, y'all are so kind. If uh, I feel like I'm uh, you know, like it's a hot mess back here um, and, and everything is barely held together with, um, you know, tissue paper. But it's great to hear that at least from the outside, it looks like everything's, yeah, everything's yeah. on point. As long as you keep the hot mess out of the view of everybody else, yeah. then it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, nobody sees the uh, the 3 a.m. panic attacks. Uh, but but no, I've been really lucky. I a lot of that is just having a great team, you know, so Mm -hmm. it looks like I do so much, but, um, but really is thanks so much to the people that I have helping me. And I get all the credit and they do all the work. You do have a, I think you have a big team. How many people do you have assisting you? Um, well on the writing, on the author side, I have my PA. Um, so she helps with social media and my group, Facebook group and things like that. And, and just reminding me about things. Um, and so her name's Trisha. And then on the Inkers Con team, we have like five people. Um, so they keep, they keep everything running there. And then I'm also um, the CEO of a tech startup called Authors AI and Binge Books. Um, and we have like 12, we have a, te- we have a big team there um, of 12 people. So that, that, those are kind of the different forces in play, you know, in my world. Wow, that's remarkable. I mean, I think of uh, Tory International, the the conglomerate holding <laughs> company, and it's not so far <laughs> from that. But if that's if you're at your home office, you know the the headquarters office, it looks like a pretty relaxed vibe. So that's- yeah, it's a very relaxed vibe. Yeah, <laughs> so nothing but dogs and sunshine. So yeah, good. Well, so I was going through your bio today on your website to make sure I didn't need to add anything else and saw that you and your husband play Scrabble. Um, (laughs) And I, when I was dating my wife, she and I and her brother were playing. And sometimes, you know, you see a word when you're playing Scrabble and like, it's just, when you say it in your head, it's not right. And so I play the word uh, B-O-T-H and my brother-in-law now, he's like, both, really? (laughs) <laughs> and and it took him, you know, just a minute to realize he had not correctly read that word. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. Well, and also a lot of times the more you stare at a word, you like start to second guess. Like, is it really spelled that way? Like, it's surely not spelled that way, you know? Um, and the more you look at it, the funnier a word can look uh, a lot of times. So but yeah, we have heated. Uh, when I met my husband, I was a horrible Scrabble player. I had no strategy. I had no, you know, I didn't think about it. And now it's like, you know, I mean, it's, it's a very competitive environment. I feel bad for our guests who visit and have no idea what they're coming into. They think they're there for like a friendly Sunday night game of Scrabble and, you know. Well, I've just started playing video games with my eight-year-old boy. Uh Um, And I used to play video games stopped for a long time and so we got him this new nba game for his nintendo switch and we've been playing together and occasionally he will tell me dad i'm not having fun i'm like sorry buddy i will rein it in that competitive (laughs) nature is just like i got to bring that back down um because we'll play on the same team and i'm trying to give him gentle instructions about how to do things better but they're not coming (laughs) off very gentle Oh, oh man! All right, That's so we evil looking coming out. Anyway, go ahead. Well, I was going to jump in here um, because we talked about all yeah. all of the things that are going on for you, um, mm-hmm. and ha- you were at this, this high point. 
I mean, hopefully it's not the high point and you have a sustained, yeah. you're like LeBron, yeah, just stay at the peak a for a long, point. long time. Um, but I have to imagine that it wasn't always that way. So before the commercial success, um, what did the writing look like for you? Well, I was, I was very lucky in that my debut novel went big. Um, so uh, when I started writing, it was in 2012, which is back when it was kind of like, you know, the gold rush. Um, so it was 2012. I was at the time an assistant, like in a real estate development firm. Um, I had never written. I'd never thought about writing. Uh, I just read like I was, you know, a voracious reader. And, um, and so I wrote my first book kind of on a lark. It was a romance. It was an erotic romance. Um, and it did okay. I mean, it was selling like five to 10 copies a day. Um, and then it worked up to like 15 to 20. Um, and I was super happy. Um, I, you know, I had like pulled out my calculator and I had said, okay, uh, if I write 10 books and each of them sell 15 copies a day, you know, like I don't ever have to go back to work again. Cause at the time <laughs> I was making I was making $38,000 a year um, in my job. And so it was like, if I could make $38,000 a year writing, and if I could do that, like if I write 10 more books or 10 books total, you know, mm -hmm. so I was really excited. Um, and then, um, and then I was going out of town that weekend. And um, I, this was like almost three months into this book. And I decided to rewrite the blurb, the book description. So I just rattled off a fresh book description, posted it on Amazon. It was the first time I had changed the book description and I left, I, I got in the car and we drove. And when I got to Memphis, which was like eight hours later, I had sold a hundred copies like during that drive. And I was like, whoa, like I thought like something's broken, but I'm not going to call Amazon and like tell them about it. Like, I'm just going to let this go. Well, my sales started like doubling, like every, like by the time I went to bed, I had 300 sales. When I woke up, I had a thousand. Um, and then I was selling like 2,500 copies a day. And it showed me that that book description, so many people had been clicking on my cover because I had like a super scandalous cover. They'd been clicking on that cover. They'd read the book description. They'd be like, yeah. And they'd move to something else. And fixing that one piece really launched like my entire career. Mm -hmm. Um, that it, I ended up selling, uh, you know, at auction to Harlequin, that book in a two book deal, multiple six figures. Um, and then suddenly it was like, oh my gosh, like this is my new career. Like forget $38,000 a year. Like that, like I, I just made enough to cover 10 years of salary, you know? Um, and so, uh, so then suddenly I had to figure out what a career looked like, you know, in this business. And it ended up taking six or seven year, more books, six or seven more books to get that same level of success. Then I dropped down to more like normal, still wildly successful compared to my first 10 to 12 books a year, you know, then it got where I'd publish a book and I'd sell a couple hundred copies a day. But in order to get back to that level of, you know, selling thousands of copies a day, it took six or seven books to get back to that point. Um, and then, um, and then I got back to that point and then I really had a hot streak for a while. Um, and that was all in romance. Um, and then I ended up and I went through a couple traditional contracts. I sold three books to Hachette, um, always had my be most success in self-publishing. Um, and then, but then ended up going back traditional with Thomas and Mercer. And that was really when I made the shift to suspense, which was really the genre I wanted to write in from the beginning. Um, I just ended up writing 22 romance novels along the way. Well, I think did you you're the... Pitch, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, did you pitch Thomas and Mercer with an idea for a suspense or how did that happen? You had success that yeah. they were both real. I had written, well, I had written a lot of romance books that had some suspense. I almost always had a suspenseful element. Um, and then I had written a, a straight, almost women's fiction suspense, um, mm -hmm. The Ghost Rider, which I self-published. So I had that kind, and we had tried to pitch that traditional and nobody was interested. I mean, we we went deep. In, I mean, I think we, we were rejected like 32 times mm -hmm. on that book. Um, and it ended up becoming very like a Goodreads Choice nomination once self-published. Like it had great success, still has great success, self-published. But um, so I kind of had that like in my, you know, I had this and we mm -hmm. ended up, um, I had written a manuscript called it ended up being every last secret, but I had written a manuscript. So I had a completed manuscript that we were pitching. Um, and the same thing, like just went out to everybody. 
and uh and Thomas and Mercer bought it preempt um and it was the editor at Thomas and Mercer was an editor who had tried to buy my romance books in the past from okay. other publishers she had recently come over so she was a romance like she knew me a lot from the romance world um and she liked my writing and I think she really likes romance books and <laughs> I've been disappointed her ever since by you know by delivering suspense but but Thomas and Mercer has been really great to me um they really have I've had tremendous success there wow. I think you're the third author that we've interviewed that's with Thomas and oh, Mercer really? and all of them have had great things to say um there's two questions I want to ask and I don't want to forget either one of them. So when you went from writer to professional writer under contract, was there a mental shift of like, I just made enough money to quit my job, but was there any mental hurdles to shifting that mindset to I'm a professional now and this is what I do? Yeah. What a great question. Um, well, one issue was I am a self-taught author who has never had training and had never worked with an editor before at all. I hadn't worked with a self-published editor or whatever. So when I first sold, um, when we sold that first book, they rushed that book. So we, we just really went through like a proofread and that was really just kind of it on that book. But then when I delivered the second book to them, um, you know, they sent back like, you know, an editorial letter and a lot of changes. And, um, I was like, I agree with all of these changes, but I have no idea how to make it. I don't know how to fix any of this stuff. Like, I agree. Like it's weak here. It's strong. Like, but I don't know how to fix what you're asking me to fix. Like, you know, um, so they were talking about like consistency in the plot arc and, you know, characters, motivations and things like that. And all of those things were things that I didn't know about, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so that was very kind of alarming to me um, at the beginning. And it was also kind of the first time I'd received feedback. So I was kind of fragile. So mm -hmm. that was really kind of the biggest struggle. Um, it was that, and it was also, I was going down these parallel paths where I was with under contract and with a publisher, but I was also self-publishing at the same time. So I was experiencing complete freedom and decision making, you know, on the self publishing side. And then, you know, the publisher would ask for, you know, here are some cover concepts, which ones do you like? I would be like, everything but, you know, number three. And then they'd be like, okay, we're going to use number three, <laughs> you know? And it was like this realization, like, oh, like I don't have any control over this, you know? Um, and so it was like, I was kind of learning two different worlds at the same time. And I was, and I was definitely, I, I talked to a grad student recently who was doing a study on things and I said, you know, I was definitely afraid to speak my mind back then. Like, um, I just wasn't confident in anything where now I think my relationships with my publishers are much different because one, I have clout, you know, and I can be more aggressive on things like, um, Thomas and Mercer has asked me for things in the past and I've just flat out refused. Um, I also have money where I could say, no, like, I'm going to take this book back or, you know, like, uh, I'm, I'd rather just walk from this deal and refund you your advance where like with my first Harlequin advance, I mean, you couldn't part me from that money, like, you know, <laughs> with a chainsaw, like, I mean, I'd already mentally spent that money and had big plans for the next, you know, five years of that money. So, um, so I would do whatever I needed to do. So, um, so my relation, so. I don't even know if I answered your question, but a lot has changed in the last 10 years into how I, and, and I don't think I did anything wrong with that first publisher. I think in the beginning, especially as a debut, you don't, I, I certainly didn't know enough to argue a point or to push back on something um, because I did, I didn't have, and whether or not it probably would have been the right thing to do pushback, but I wouldn't have known that because I didn't know enough to know back then. Can I just jump in? And I know you've got another question. So hang on to that because we're going to want that. So are you still self and traditionally published? And how many books while you're doing all the rest of this are you trying to pump out a year? Well, right now I'm doing a horrible job of public, of writing. Uh, so right now I'm down to one book a year. I was writing four books a year. Um, so when I was writing, so I I was writing four books a year. And now that I have the other businesses, I'm down to one. I'm 
making serious efforts right now to at least go up to two where I can do a self-published because I haven't written a romance book in three years, maybe four. Yeah. Um, so I want to at least self-publish a romance book every year and then also have my traditional, you know, books with Thomas Mercer. And they're on about a one, one a year, um, you know, time frame right now. But at, there was a time when I was writing four years. So t today I have um four eight nine traditionally published books give or take um and about like 22 self-published books wow so when you got that going backwards here when you mm -hmm. got the feedback of hey these are issues we want you to address with the structure of the story and all the things that go with that not something you dealt with before how did you get comfortable what did you have to do to make those changes and learn how to revise the work and make it better so um it working with great editors really is what did what did that so i would do my best attempt like i would say okay i don't know what this means when you say the character is not consistent from the beginning to the end, I don't know what that means, you know? Um, and so can you, can like, we talk through this and then can you explain how I would fix that? Um, and so then she would give examples or point out in the text where that was happening. Um, and so then, then I understand, you know, then I would try my best and then we would go back. But my, um, my second traditional published um, editor who was with Hachette, her name is Susan Barnes. She now is a freelance. She's the most fantastic editor I've ever had. And um, she made she is really the one who made me so much better because Harlequin, like we did have changes and we did. But when I sold my first book to Susan with Hachette, um, she like we gutted that book and we really and she's the one that really taught me kind of how to rewrite. Um, and how to not be afraid to throw away 20 or 30,000 words, you know, and, um, and to work like she worked me hard. And I remember, I mean, cursing her and saying, I'm never, ever going to work with her again. And, but it was cause she was making me work, you know? And, um, and then my husband be like, didn't you, you know, like I would sign another book with her and he'd go, didn't you just, just say that you'd never going to work with her again? But she would bring such great writing out of me, you know, um, and it was one of those like I hated it when I was in it. But at the end, I would look back and I go, wow, like that. When I look at what we started with and what we finished with, like she really made me shine. So I would have to say just working with great editors and then just writing and writing and writing and not being afraid to throw away stuff and trying to figure out, you know, I would write something and say, no, this didn't, you know, this didn't, this didn't do it, you know? And it would be little stuff like make this scene bigger. Like, what does that mean? Like make this scene bigger. Like, I don't know what that means, you know? Um, and just having a patient editor who would explain what that meant and me being receptive to that and not having an ego in the room, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that last part is huge. And so I'm a lawyer by trade. And when I talk to younger lawyers and you know if somebody wants advice i always tell people like being coachable is the best thing you can do for your career and the mm -hmm. same thing is true any in career. in any career whether it's writing yeah. or anything else being receptive to feedback and a lot of people talk about you know their books their novels whatever like it's a child I'm like it's not a child because you have yeah. to be willing to tear this thing apart it's and yeah yeah and so I think that's huge of being receptive to that feedback. You may not always agree with it. And Barb and I have talked about one of her stories that um, she could have sold it to a traditional publisher, um, but they wanted to change one of the really cornerstone pieces of it that she didn't feel was right and didn't, but at the same, and it was the right decision for that book. And at the same mm -hmm. time, we've talked with her and her writing coach on the podcast about all the things that in every book, they go through piece by piece and have to change. And so being willing to make those changes and being receptive to feedback um, and, and criticism is, is huge. So that's so true. I agree. You know, right, as, as authors, we're producing a commercial product. I mean, if you want to be 
sell. If you want to be commercially successful, you're producing a product. And if you can't take oh. your product feed, I don't think it's, it's going to work for you. You just have to be willing to be open to that and not get your ego in the way. What do you want to do here? You want to sell books? Well, that's how you do it. Yeah. Don't be precious about it. Um, yes. Okay. Here's the other question that I wanted to come back to, because you've mentioned a couple of times um, that you're selling both traditional and indie. And you've mentioned a couple of times that your best sellers have been your indie published books. And so, you know, Barb is indie published. I am. We just did a podcast about me looking for representation on the fifth novel that I'm writing um, and and considering making you know a change as far as that goes. Um, but I'm curious why, and I don't want it, why when your bestsellers have been self-published, are you considering and looking at going the other route as well? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, let, for, let me first, clarify that my book, my self-published books were always my most successful until I signed with Thomas and Mercer. Um, and my, since then my Thomas and Mercer books have eclipsed in mm -hmm. as far as earnings and sales, my self-published books. Um, so I, I do want to say that, but before I signed with Thomas and Mercer, my self-published books were outselling my traditionally published books like 10 to one. I mean, it wasn't even anywhere close. I mean, maybe 20 to one. It was ridiculously, my uh, traditionally published books were all tanking and my self-published books were hitting the New York times list, you know? So, um, so then I would often have that question, like, so why are you wanting to go traditional, you know? And I turned down a lot of traditional deals during those six or seven years. Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't until like I had the ghostwriter that I really felt could be commercially successful. And it was one of those things like it was like, I know I can reach this level with my self-published, but this is a non-romance book. This is out of my normal audience. And I think it could appeal to a, a broad, bigger audience. Um, and so that was why I tried the ghostwriter. Now I didn't get a traditional deal. So then when it came time for this next book, it was the same thing. I had the same, like, I have a feeling, but it was like, but I only want a deal. If it's, if it's a big deal, that's either in, insane money or um, where I don't care if it's successful or it's like, I'm going to like, I am almost guaranteed that it is going to have a humongous print run and it's going to be massive um because i wanted to be in airports i wanted to be in you know all of the places that thomas mercer is not getting me <laughs> but but i wanted all i wanted that bigger range you know um and so that was why i and i was and i was branching to psychological suspense which was a new thing and that was really where i wanted to go so it was kind of it was like let me see and when amazon and amazon i had been side-eyeing kind of for a while because i had been seeing a lot of their authors books you know hitting the top and i liked things like first reads and things like that so when i negotiated with amazon and there was a very high chance i would be first reads they couldn't guarantee it but there were certain things it was like okay right now i am spending you know at the time i was spending you know, $2,000 a day in Facebook ads on a new release. You know, mm -hmm. I was, you know, spending X amount on AMS ads and it was like, okay, I, I can take all of that off of my, off of my list. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and they, and, and they will fill that in for me in terms of promotion on the site. Um, so that was it. It was like, I was kind of taking a risk with suspense you know, another suspense book. I was taking a risk. I was going to a new thing and that was able me to remove the risk, but also hopefully expose me to a, a totally new audience that I wasn't able to get, um, or that I couldn't afford to pay for through, through advertising. Um, and so that was really, and it was a gamble. It was just a two book deal. And it was really, I mean, we were very much like, let's just see how this goes again. At the time I was writing four books a year. So what what is one or two books, you know, headed this in this bucket? Um, if I did it now where I'm only writing one book a year, I don't know that I would make that big of a risk. Um, but at the time it, it made sense. And then those books took off, you know, so then it was easy. I'm about to sign my third deal with them. Mm -hmm. um, so well, that reasoning makes a lot of sense. And I think it fits the same conversation that Barb and I had about my fifth novel, because my first four have all been just dark fantasy, which is a pretty niche category. And then this fifth book is contemporary mystery and suspense. 
and it fits a much larger commercial market um, that I'm not in. And I, you know, somebody to amplify that and get me in places that I wouldn't otherwise be makes a lot of sense to me about, and it's a well-considered, you know, reason to do it as opposed to a lot of folks who just like, well, I just want to be traditionally published to have that name on it. This was a business decision. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's smart. I've always like checked out the grass on the other side because you don't know unless you, unless you try, you know, I mean, you can always turn down a deal, but you should at least know your options, you know? So if you've got the time and you have a manuscript and you have the ability to shop it and you, especially if you already have an agent or whatever, it's just good to know your options. And that's why a lot of times I've, there's over the years, I've turned down a lot of traditional offers. Um, Mm -hmm. but I knew, I felt like I knew if, if one crossed my desk that I, that I really liked, um, and this was that opportunity. Oh, hit my mic. Go ahead. Your whole other life is your Inkers Con business, which we don't have much time to, to talk about, but since you were so successful writing books and selling books and going to the bank with your royalties, what possessed you to want to, you know, get into this arena and you're at the top of the field on that too it was it was pretty selfish actually it was uh so uh when I first started and I was wandering around I I really had a like a blind marketing approach I would wander in one direction like with my eyes closed till I hit a wall and then I'd be like okay and then I'd turn I'd wander another direction and that's how I was with my writing and my marketing at the beginning so early on I was like once I figure this out like at the time in 2012, there wasn't courses and there wasn't online classes and there wasn't Facebook groups and things like that. Um, I really wanted like a writing for dummies, a marketing for dummies, publishing for dummies kind of classes. So I initially created those that I taught. Um, so I created, sorry, a plane's going over. I don't know if it's loud for you, but, um, but, at, but then it was like, I quickly realized, and I loved that creation process because it really made me examine my writing process because I didn't really know how I wrote. I would just sit down and write something. So it really made me think about like how I put things together. Um, but then it was like, okay, I've exhausted like what I know. And now I want to know what the top people in every field knows, you know? So it was, it was one of those things like, and initially we had planned on like, let's just bring in the top 10 or 15 people in these different areas, bring them all together and record a class from each person. And it wasn't intended to be an interact, like a live event. It was, it was just going to be, we're going to bring everybody together, film them together. So it would be consistent film footage Mm -hmm. and then release it. And then I was like, well, if we're bringing everybody together, it just seems crazy not to then allow authors to be here. You know what I mean? And like, let's make a party of it. And that was really how it turned into a a conference. It wasn't the, it, the goal wasn't initially to be a conference. It was to be like a, a, a really intensive course that learned from a lot of different voices mm-hmm. um, because no, none of us are the best at it, anything. You know what I mean? I mean, we all have like an area we're really strong in. And then I want to learn from the person who's really, really strong just in, in this, whatever that is. Well, I can appreciate the selfish motivation because um, <laughs> my motivation for this podcast is exactly that. Like, um, yeah, this is how I want to can... learn from the <laughs> smart ones. <laughs> yes. Like, let's talk to writers who are doing amazing craft stuff and amazing business stuff and and learn. And this is how I can have those conversations because mm-hmm. otherwise that's not really a reality. So conferences, podcasts, whatever you can do to get <laughs> to get into a conversation with people you might not otherwise have a chance to talk to and learn from them, I'm all in favor of. And we have such a great community in just info sharing. Like our our uh, attendees are the best. Like we had over a hundred attendee led video conversations last year at uh, Inkers Con, and I was just shot. Like I mean, everyone's sharing what works and what doesn't, and you can learn just as much from something that didn't work for someone as you can learn, you know, for what what does work. It's a very, the author community is very supportive. It's not a competitive, we're all lawyers. It's not like a lawyer, a group of lawyers in a room, which is, you know, a whole lot of evil energy, but um, sometimes, but authors are kind to each other. And you're absolutely right. We are, whether you're traditionally or self-published, we're all authorpreneurs and we all have to know 
such a wide range of things. Some of it is in your natural wheelhouse and other stuff is very far afield. doesn't matter. You need to know something about it. And I started in 2012 and it was the same thing, just three hours every night reading blog posts, trying to educate myself, wasn't very effective. So thank goodness you've created this community where people can come and get really good and updated answers. Yeah, I feel your pain. 2012, it was like the Wild West. We didn't know what to, I mean, I remember paying for a press release, like, because yes. yes. I didn't know what else to do to share news about my book. I mean, I remember yeah. when I discovered Facebook ads and I was like, oh my gosh, there's this like whole, yeah. Yeah, sea of power things. editor and all that evil stuff on Facebook. It, yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, yep. the old K, K blogs and stuff. Yeah, it was, it was yes. crazy. Yeah. Well, as we get ready to close this out, I want to ask you one more writing related question because um, you've gone from writing romance with suspense elements to writing suspense novels. So was there trepidation for you in in hopping from one genre to another and knowing the success that you have versus the potential success that you might have? Um, you know, whether it's from a business or a personal perspective, um, what did you struggle with that decision and how, how did you decide to move forward? Oh, uh, what a great question. So uh, I didn't really have any trepidation because, um, I mean, I had some trepidation over whether my audience would follow me. Right. Um, but I'd already they had already when I wrote The Ghost Writer, it was like, this is my passion project. I'm going to publish it. I don't care if it doesn't sell three copies. Like I just, I have to write this book. And when that book took off and when that book did really well, that really gave me then the security to say, okay, I think I can write more books like this and mm -hmm. someone's going to buy it. It might not be my, my hardcore romance girls, but some, you know, somebody's going to buy it. Um, so that gave me the confidence. And then creatively, um, romance has always been a struggle for me. One, because I didn't read romance. So I've never read romance. I still don't read romance, which is like the cardinal sin. You should always read what you, you know, write. Um, but I didn't read it. So I didn't know the rules of romance when I started. I didn't write on market. I really broke like a lot of rules because I didn't know what I was doing. Where suspense was something I had always read so much suspense that I really knew that genre. And it was like suddenly all these rules, like I could kill my main character, you know, I could make my main character a bad person. <laughs> like when you start writing a book, anything could be the answer. Where romance, it was like you always had to have that happy ending, right? And you always, the couple, I mean, the reader always knew that the couple is going to get together at the end. So it's really hard to keep the reader guessing. Um, so it was so much more challenging for me to write romance where suspense, I could just hit the ground running because I, because I knew that world and I knew that market. And, and again, it was like, like my training wheels were off and I could just do whatever I wanted. And I, and I absolutely love that. Before we go, make sure to tell people where they can find you, your 1600 projects you're working on <laughs> and everything you've got going on. Absolutely. So if you visit Alessandra Torre Inc. I -N -K .com, um, there you can see a lot of helpful articles I've written and um and information and uh on me and um and my books is alessandratory.com. But um Inkers Con is really I have classes and courses at Alessandra Torre Inc., but Inkers Con is is really a product that I'm the most proud of and that I really believe is the most helpful, no matter if you're you know, super experienced or aspiring authors, that's really where, cause I, I can, I mean, that's where I have the most confidence uh, and pride in that product. So yeah, inkerscon.com, you can, um, you can check out and we're in, uh, we have our upcoming conference in Dallas or you can attend online. So uh, yeah, I hope to see some of you guys there. All right. Thanks so and much. And I read your suspense novels and they are fabulous. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Means the most coming from another author, so I really.